give everyone a chance to log in who's uh, registered for this evening's program. Again, thank you. We really appreciate it. We'll pretend some people are stuck in traffic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we've, uh, we've got a minute after six, so we should get going. Um, again, good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us. My name is Michael King, and I'm the executive director of the Southwest Seattle Historical Society, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to this month's Words, Writers, and Southwest Stories <clears throat> presentation. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that the Southwest Seattle Historical Society and our beloved Log House Museum are located on the traditional lands of the Duwamish people, past and present. We are grateful here at the Historical Society to the Duwamish peoples, uh, Seattle's first people, for stewarding this land throughout the generations. It really is hard to believe that we are joined together here for our second to last Words, Writers, and Southwest Stories presentation of the calendar year. It's gone by quickly, but uh, we're glad you've joined us for tonight's program, uh, which uh, happens to fall on Veterans Day, as we all know. And I, I, if there's any veterans that are uh, tuning in this evening, I, I'd like you to know that the Historical Society is grateful for your service to our country. Uh, we're also, of course, very excited to welcome this evening's uh, presenter, who Dora Fay is going to introduce momentarily. Uh, uh, but before uh, that happens, I'd like to take a moment to uh, thank our partners at the Seattle Public Library, whose support helps to sustain this series. And I'd also like to thank our sponsors, Luna Park Cafe, Alki Beach Academy, For Culture, Duwamish Tribal Services, and Home Street Bank, and, and their generosity makes these free experiences possible for all of us. So we are truly grateful to all of them. And of course, thanks again to all of you for joining us tonight. Um, I know many of you have tuned into our programs before, but if you're joining us for the first time, we're gonna use the Q&A function at the bottom, it should be at the bottom of your screen for our question and answer session this evening. Um, our, our speaker's gonna take questions at the end of his presentation and uh, uh, we'll, uh, Dora Fay, our series chair, will moderate and, and direct questions on your behalf to this evening's presenter. So with all that said, thank you again for joining us. We hope you enjoy tonight's program. I'm gonna turn things over to Dora Fay Hendricks, who's a board member here at the Historical Society and the chair of this wonderful series. Thank you, Michael. And thank all of you for being here. I was going to brag a little bit. It was in October of nine years ago that this series started, and I've been the chair this time. I mean, all this time, and it's always fun. So tonight, I'm going to introduce Jim Roop. You've read the information about him. I'm going to introduce him a little bit more thoroughly, I hope. Jim is the author of Art in Seattle's Public Spaces, From Soto to South Lake Union, published in 2019 by the University of Washington Press. Jim is a Seattle native, longtime lawyer, and a local historian, and has collected information about art in Seattle public spaces for over 40 years. He started when he was two, is that correct, Jim? That's about right. Yeah. His first book, Art in Seattle's Public Places, an Illustrated Guide, was published by the University of Washington Press in 1992. His latest book, Art in Seattle's Neighborhood Public Spaces, a book um, that covers over 350 artworks displayed throughout Seattle outside of the downtown area. This is the book he will be presenting to us tonight. Jim is also writing a cultural history of Seattle from 1900 to 1910. I haven't learned much uh, else about where he's from, except I ask him tonight where he went to school or if he has a family or not. So let me ask him now. Jim, you want to uh, brag about how long your family's been in the area? Oh, gosh, I've been, let's see, I was born here and my parents were born here in 1913. And uh, I think you asked me about uh, family. I have a wife and two kids. They're both uh, just graduated from college. So we're empty nesters until they come back. Uh, so that's the story. Yeah, I do wanted to clarify one thing. The, uh, as you'll hear in this talk, the neighborhood book is something I'm working on. Uh, I'll be talking about the book that's in front of you at the moment from Art in Seattle's Public Spaces from Soto to South Lake Union. All right, well, good. Thank you for that. Well, welcome to Words, Writers, and Southwest Stories, Jim. We're happy to have you here with us. So take it away. 
All right. Well, you know, one of the first questions that people ask me about with, with this book and then the earlier book was, how did you come about doing this book? And it all started when I was in high school. I started collecting uh, information about artworks because there weren't any resources available. There were no plaques in front of sculptures. They didn't tell you what it was. And I think life is more interesting and enjoyable if you're aware of your surroundings and and what may be unappreciated at the outset when you see an artwork, it may become pretty interesting once you are able to learn something. Maybe it's going to be meaningful to you or moving. And if you know something about them, it just makes it more interesting. My first book, Art in Seattle's Public Places, as uh, Dorfe mentioned, was published in 1992. It covered Seattle and SeaTac, 22 chapters, 300 artworks, a little over 300 artworks. This, like my current book, is not a book of criticism. It's a book that tells you about things. People can make their own decision whether they like it or not. They just get the information and what artists have to say about it and how it got there and sometimes who paid for it. The newest book, uh, oh, and this, these are the chapters in the original book. I included SeaTac at the time. Uh, there are too many artworks to include it in the neighborhood book that'll be coming up. But in addition, unfortunately, nowadays you can't go to SeaTac and just look at art. Very impressive collection, but that's another story. The new end, and as I said, uh, the current book uh, covers over 350 artworks, 300 colored photographs. Uh, there are nine chapters, and there's a lot more art than there used to be. Uh, as an example, this is the main map of the current book, Art in Seattle's Public Spaces from Soto, Chapter 1, to South Lake Union up to Chapter 9. In the original book, the Denny Regrade uh, encompasses what is now Chapters 8, 9, and Part of 3, and there were only 11 works there. That was Belltown, the Denny Triangle, and the South Lake Union. Now, this is Chapter 9 of the current book, this is South Lake Union, and there are 34 works there now, just in that one portion. Half of that was put there by Paul Allen. Uh, he had a good practice of when his companies built a building, and whether it was for his venture or it was going to be occupied by Amazon or whoever, uh, they all got together and installed artworks. And this is a typical map for the book. It allows you to create your own tour. I tell people, uh, you know, it's a good, it's a good date book. You can uh, get your own book and, and do your own tour. Next up, as mentioned, is Art in Seattle's Neighborhood Public Places. Uh, that's going to be an additional 350 artworks in 15 chapters. The UW chapter, chapter three, will have over 40 works because that's the largest collection of state-owned state artworks in the state. West Seattle, chapter 15, which had 17 artworks in the 1992 book, uh, will have over 25 works. I say over because uh, there are a number of little pocket parks that have maybe three or four little artworks, and that'll be counted as one artwork, but you'll learn all about them. So how did the, all of the art in our city get there? Well, it started with the totem pole down in Pioneer Square. The design of this pole honors the chief of all women. Uh, she was a Klingit noblewoman who had drowned in the Nass River on her way to help a sister who was ill. And this was dedicated in her memory. And the pole uses symbolism of the Raven clan, one of two Klingit clans. And it depicts how ravens stole the sun and moon from the raven at the head of Nass. Uh, and by doing that, brought light to the world. In the old days, the world was dark until the clever raven uh, stole both the sun and the moon. You hear that in a lot of native uh, culture in this area, uh, but this pole has certain images that are typical of the, of the Klingit raven clan. This particular pole was created in 1940 by Klingit carvers near Ketchikan. It replaced an original pole that was installed in 1899, but due to a fire and, and a lot of rot, they had to take that out. It was just, there was irreparable damage. And at the time, the federal government had a program up in Alaska that was promoting the restoration of native poles. And they said, Seattle, we can help you out. And so they had a team of local carvers, some of whom were related to the lineage and the original clan that carved the original one. The original pole was, uh, was in the Klingit village of Tongas, Alaska. 
Unfortunately, uh, it got here because the Chamber of Commerce of Seattle took a tour by boat up in that area and thought there's a totem pole in a village that they said was abandoned and it wasn't really. Uh, people were out working uh, and there were some old people and some children around, but they decided to cut it down and bring it back because they wanted to make this a symbol of Seattle as the gateway to Alaska. That was important because in the gold rush, uh, the Yukon gold rush of 1897, this was the place to come to if you're gonna go up and look for gold. You got your supplies and you got your ship and headed up north. So the chamber said, this is perfect. Uh, this will be a symbol of Alaska and a symbol of Seattle. Uh, their theft, of course, was controversial even at the time. Uh, and the villagers reportedly uh, did accept a $500 settlement after a lawsuit was commenced a complicated story that I can't get into all the facts, but there it is. Uh, but the odd thing is that the totem pole is not from this area. Totem, totem art is not from this area. It's from British Columbia and Southeast Alaska. It's not uh, part of the, uh, the artworks in this region, but it's seen throughout Seattle, uh, how it became that way. And there's so many examples as a story in itself. Uh, the Salish people of this region, including the Duwamish, they didn't have totem poles. They had, they had lodge poles that they decorated and their carving style was less detailed, the lower relief, and it wasn't as public as the Northwest Coast art that you're seeing here. So white folks really didn't pay any attention to it. They didn't think it was Im as impressive. An example of Salish art is this story pole, which is at Belvedere Park in West Seattle. It was installed in 2006 and it replaced the pole. It's now in front of the Log House Museum. It's by Michael Halliday. He's a fifth generation descendant of Chief Seattle. And this story shows the Duwamish people welcoming the first settlers at Alki Point in 1851. So you can see the faces of the people welcoming the settlers. And about a third of the way up from the bottom, you'll see something sticking out, the only piece in high relief. That's a ship's stern that's representing the ship that brought the people here originally. And you can see the mast and sails extending up from it. The 1899 pole was the first of the city's artworks and there was really nothing more until 1909. And then that was the year we had our first World's Fair, the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition, which took place on the UW campus. This was a, as an era of heroic sculptures. And there's a time when statues were the sole art for public places. Unlike Eastern cities, there's not much of that here. Uh, we don't have revolutionary or civil war generals to commemorate and there's really no connection there that would merit having a bronze statue. But the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition, that opened the door to have some sculptures made and the prominent, predominant one that's still around is George Washington. And this was by Laredo Taft of New York. And it's typical of the time. Here's George Washington with a great uh, coat and, and a broad sword that he never would have held. But uh, here he is the heroic founder, first president of the country, and that's the way they depicted him back then. The death of John Hart McGraw in 1910 inspired another statue, which was created in 1912 by Richard Brooks of New York. Richard Brooks uh, uh, was the one who also created this uh, Seward sculpture up in Volunteer Park. McGraw was the state's second governor. He had a major role in the legislation to create the cut between Lake Washington and the Sound. As a matter of fact, his platform when he ran for governor was dig the ditch, and that was successful. But uh, interesting also, he was the sheriff during the Chinese problems of the mid-1880s, uh, that was a pretty miserable situation where in Tacoma, uh, people actually drew, drove the Chinese down to the wharf, put them on ships and drove them out of town. In Seattle, uh, people tried to do the same thing. And John Hart McGraw, who was the sheriff at the time, and a number of business leaders and judges and lawyers uh, put a stop to it. Uh, Roger Sale in Seattle's, in his book, Seattle Past to Present, said that during the worst of the troubles, McGraw was consistently sensible, cool, and strong. As a side, I should note that uh, although it's true uh, that they didn't get driven out of Seattle, effectively, 
uh, as a result of all the hard feelings and, and the threats to Chinese, most of the Chinese left and the population of Chinese in Seattle went precipitously down after all these problems in the 1880s. James Wen's 1912 sculpture of Seattle is another classic sculpture. By the way, James Wen, uh, in the old days, before we were sensitive, we used to call him the first sculptor of Seattle. And then people realized that there were an awful lot of people around here before the white settlers showed up. So he's the first Western sculptor of Seattle. Now, this is based in part on an 1864 photo taken by E.M. Samus, and it's Seattle in his, in his 70s. And this is the way people mostly think of Chief Seattle. But he really was a vigorous and impressive chief with a very commanding voice. And in David Berge's book, Chief Seattle and the Town That Took His Name, which I recommend to you, he said that a contemporary described Seattle as a square-shouldered, deep-chested, stockily built Indian with a voice like a trumpet. And when, when Seattle spoke, boy, the room or wherever he was speaking, everybody was quiet and listened intently. And Seattle statues as the dominant form of sculptures were pretty much gone by the 1920s. There are some 20th century exceptions, as with earlier statues that you've seen, they were all donated. Uh, they weren't commissioned by any government programs, which we do now, which I'll get to. Uh, Leif Erikson is one example. He stands at Shilshul Bay. He was commissioned by Norwegians who lived in Seattle. Uh, the sculptor is a guy named August Werner. And it was dedicated on Norwegian Day, 1962, during the World's Fair. Ivor Hagland is another example. After he died, his friends got together and commissioned Richard Beyer to create this sculpture, which is down near Ivers on the waterfront. Uh, typical of, of uh, Richard Beyer, uh, it's a little comical. Uh, you know, they, they're outsized uh, gulls. And you'll note that one gull has his head under the chair and he's chasing a little clam with feet and the clam is running away from him. Beyer is the creator of the kind of iconic Seattle sculpture waiting for the interurban in Fremont. And West Seattle people also know that he is the creator of Whale's Tale, which he did in 1982. I always thought this park had become Whale's Tale, Whale's Tale Park because that's what a lot of people call it, but it's still uh, really the Alki playground. The world of sports is an exception to the general rule also. Uh, outside of T-Mobile Field, we see Ken Griffey Jr. on the left and then Edgar Martinez on the right. These are by Lou Sella. Edgar was just installed just recently. Uh, and Lou is a fellow who specializes in sports sculpture, and he also did the uh, Don James sculpture at Husky Stadium. Now, the general rule regarding statues is also true with contemporary versus older war memorials. There are few statues now. I think once the Vietnam Memorial uh, made such an impact, uh, there was less uh, creation of human figures. Uh, things were created more of a, for an emotional impact. Uh, and a lot, I think, frankly, a lot of people cry at the Vietnam War Memorial more than they do with the statues that are nearby. Doughboy bringing home victory is an example here in Seattle. This is by Alonzo Victor Lewis, who was quite an active sculptor in Seattle. He created this in 1932. It stands out at the Evergreen Washelli Cemetery, really a perfect place for it. It used to be kind of hidden behind the, uh, the opera house in the Seattle center. Compare this with the more moving Garden of Remembrance by Robert Morase, one of the region's most highly regarded landscape architects. A uh, prominent architect in Seattle, John Nessholm, said that Morase was a poet of stone and water, and all these stones and the placement were all designed by him. All around are names of people who died in the various wars. Uh, portions of letters are engraved in the walls, very moving letters home, things like that. Some commentary, and a poem by Archibald MacLeish, which says in part, the young dead soldiers do not speak whether our lives and our deaths were for peace and a new hope or for nothing, we cannot say. We leave you our deaths, give them their meaning. We were young, we have died, remember us. Now the pieces I've shown you from the first half of the 20th century are all commemorative. 
big change in 1959. That was the first time they had private commissions of art for art's sake, not art just to be a pretty, uh, you know, decorative item uh, and, and place them in office buildings. The Logan and the Norton buildings were the two examples. The Logan building's been uh, torn down. It was on Union and Fifth, but the Norton building remains. These were the first offices built in Seattle or the first buildings, office buildings built in Seattle since the 1930s. So, you know, things were a little different back then. We have a lot of construction now, but it wasn't the case. At the Norton building at Second, Second and Columbia, they commissioned uh, Philip McCracken to do Restless Bird. Here's a bird that's crouching and ready to pounce. He's pretty abstract, the people who developed the building the Norton Clapp family interest, they wanted a contemporary expression that was compatible with the modern building. My father used to work near there and people at the time, uh, this, this crouching bird has his rear end up pretty high and they just referred to it as the big ass bird. And it was something new, this abstract stuff, but uh, people don't refer to it as that anymore. They've grown to love the piece and it's done very well in that location. Now, in the late 50s and 60s, uh, there were a few public projects that were installed uh, for art, just for art's sake, uh, but not much by today's standards. But an example is the Fountain of Wisdom. It's now with the new Seattle Public Library. It was created in 1958 for the one that they tore down to replace what's there now. This is by George Sudakawa. It's his very first fountain sculpture. Uh, it's the first of over 70 fountains that he placed around the world. George has 11 artworks in Seattle's public spaces, not just downtown, but throughout the city. And this is a good, ex good example of what made George famous. Uh, rather than just have a uh, bronze work that's squirting out water, uh, he extended the water to kind of extend the shape of the fountain itself. So you can see all of these uh, sections of water flowing out. They didn't used to do that. Matter of fact, uh, when George was in Europe, uh, before he created this, he got a little tired of all those sorts of uh, you know, things spouting out of, of horses' mouths and things like that that you'd see in Italy. Now, the 1962 World's Fair, our second World's Fair, was the big, biggest public art event of the 20th century, with many commissioned artworks. Three major pieces remain. Uh, the 60-foot-long Seattle mural by Paul Horiuchi is a glass tile mosaic and it's inspired by the torn paper collages that made him famous. Fountain of Creation by Everett Dupin has, it's still there and has three elements. Uh, in the foreground, the birds represent the sky and the, on the left, uh, it represents the sea and that's seaweed. And the land is uh, represented by a large vertical piece on the right. Uh, it, it's called the tree of life and it shows development from protozoans to fish, mammals and humans. Those are uh, figures in the center that evolve upwards. The last piece is Fountain of the Northwest by James Fitzgerald, who was very well known in his time. Uh, in this case, uh, he created these craggy, eroded bronze uh, sculptures uh, that make it look like the water in age has, has eroded the, the original shape down to this. Very well received. Uh, it is uh, one of two. There's one in Princeton University. Uh, this is at the, um, the Cornish uh, Playhouse in Seattle Center. The one at Princeton is in a big reflecting pool and it doesn't look half as good as this one. So that's a good thing since Fitzgerald was from here. The 1960s and 1970s were an important period when major corporations around the country commissioned grand sculptures for their public spaces. But Seattle didn't really do much of that because we didn't have those big, big corporations. We did have Seafirst Bank, and Seafirst Bank uh, bought three-piece sculpture vertebra, a Henry Moore sculpture that he created in 1968, and that's still there across from the library. It's one of four. There's one at the Hirshhorn Museum in Washington, D.C. There's one in the Israeli Museum in Jerusalem, and there's one in Henry Moore's estate in England. Each one is different. Uh, in this case, Don Winkleman, the architect in charge of the building, was working with Henry Moore and they had a little, they precisely where it was going to go, a little metal thing sticking up so they could place the, uh, the sculpture there. But when they were doing the welding, the sculpture got a little distorted and they couldn't fit it the way it had been planned. 
Winkleman called Henry Moore, and Henry Moore said, Don, you and I have worked for a long time. You place it the way you think it ought to be. And so he placed it, and Henry Moore approved it. And there's just a, if you look at it, there's a little bit of a tension because these pieces look like they ought to interlock. They're basically pieces of vertebra, but they don't. They just about do, but they don't quite fit. This, like the, uh, the big ass bird I was telling you about that people grew to love, this is how, this is an example of how the passage of time can make a difference in appreciation. People used to say, you know, Henry Moore, this is just a bunch of bones. Uh, we don't quite understand why taking little bones and making them into large sculptures, monumental pieces really does anything. Uh, but uh, people grew to love the piece. Uh, and in 1968, word got out that the piece had been sold to Japanese investors and all hell broke loose. And people said, you can't take our sculpture out of Seattle. So a number of uh, wealthy patrons uh, bought it back from the Japanese. And this now on, is, belongs to the uh, Seattle Art Museum. It's the only sculpture that is not on Seattle Art Museum property. <clears throat> now, as I said, the major commissions by international corporations are not the norm in Seattle. However, we have local developers who like art and believe it adds to the experience and class of their buildings. Uh, two significant developers who are art collectors are Martin Selig and Richard Hadreen. Selig's most interesting venture into the world of art in our public spaces is what I call the Selig Sculpture Plaza. I don't know if Martin calls it that, but that's what I call it. And there are four sculptures on Elliott Avenue uh, in between two buildings that he owns. And here is one. This is called Three Obliques Walk-In by Barbara Hepworth. Hepworth was a contemporary of Henry Moore and is probably uh, the, the second most uh, famous uh, sculptor of that period in England. Now people look at this and they think, okay, well, it's just a bunch of uh, straight edges with some circles. But what she was getting at is she was creating interrelated planes and voids and, and incorporating into her artwork the effect of light and shade has on the forms. And she said, you can't look at sculpture if you're going to stand stiff as a ramrod and stare at it. With sculpture, you must walk around it and bend toward it and touch it and walk away from it. She also said you could climb through it. I don't think, I didn't put that in the book. I don't think Martin Seelig would like people climbing through this uh, expensive sculpture of his, but that was what she was, th this was a, a piece that people could relate to by wandering around in and around it. The most, most recent installation by Seelig is Adam by Fernando Botero, very well-known contemporary artist. This is at Second Avenue in Madison. It's typical of his paintings and sculpture. Uh, he was influenced heavily by the 17th century Flemish artist, Peter Paul Rubens. But his weighty kind of inflated forms go far beyond the Rubenesque figures. Having it all black, uh, when my mother-in-law uh, drove by this, when, she, when it was first installed, she thought it was inflated rubber, which I can understand. But uh, that is the only Botero, as far as I know, on display in a public place in the Northwest. Richard Hadreen, I mentioned, he's placed sculptures in many of the downtown hotels he's developed. This is one of the most unusual. This is called Black Diorite Negative Wall Sculpture. This is in the lobby of his new hotel near the convention center. It's by Michael Heiser. It's 5.7 ton stone. It's set into a 31 inch deep rusted steel box. What Heiser is getting at, he just took out a mass of the wall, created a void and filled it with something else. What's it mean? It means nothing. He's a minimalist. It is what it is. Uh, when you see it, you might be very impressed with the fact that this huge thing seems to be kind of balanced in the wall. Uh, you may be impressed with the, with the texture of the stone against the flat wall, but you may not uh, be impressed at all, but that's fine. Uh, you may be impressed later. If you're not impressed at all, Heiser thinks that's fine too. Those thoughts bring me to Heiser's best known work here. This is a Jason against a pond. It's at Seattle's uh, Myrtle Edwards Park on Elliott Bay. And as you can see, there are three boulders, and an immense, with 50 tons, one's about 34 tons. And one is adjacent to its base. Uh, the other is against it and the other is upon it. 
this was created in 1976. It was commissioned uh, by the city and then uh, the National Endowment for the Arts put up some money and some private funding was also helpful. As with the negative wall sculpture, it has no meaning. Uh, there's a myth that this, the farther the boulders are from their base, it means that he's referring to the, the increasing distance of the urban dweller from the natural environment. And isn't it lovely that it looks out over the Olympic mountains and it all fits? Well, that's not true at all. This is a placement of boulders in a manner in which they assume their own character, whether you like it or not. They may create an impact, they may not. And now you may ask, how do I know this? Well, it just didn't make sense to me that this would have a message to it. There's nothing about Heiser that would support that. So I contacted Heiser and he said, absolutely right. And to give you an example of how Heiser works, eight years before, he created nine Nevada depressions uh, in the um, Nevada desert. This is one of those. And how did you, Mr. Heiser, how did you figure out where precisely those should be placed? Well, he took matchsticks and he held them up at two feet and he dropped them. And, and they, some of them landed in an interesting fashion and that's how those uh, slots became part of the desert. Let's move on to some more realistic artworks. I mentioned smaller developers, uh, an example of uh, uh, that is the University Village. It's been installing larger Gerber sculptures on its property since 1995. This, as you may know, is not at the University Village, but this is Gerber's best known work. This is Rachel, uh, the Pike Place Market Pig. It has a more formal title, but it's, uh, it's modeled after Rachel, a pig that she had up on Whidbey Island. The village now has five commissioned works. It's the largest collection of uh, Gerber sculptures in a public space. Here are four of them. They're all delightful pieces that uh, kids and parents love and the kids can play in the water features and the dog in the upper right hand corner was a surprise to one of the owners. Uh, that's his dog Archie and they thought they would put that there and, and surprise the owner and it's uh, very well received. West Seattleites may recall that Gerber is the one who created the seals on Alki. This was created in 2013. It's called Sentinels of the Sound. It was commissioned through the efforts of Robin Lindsay of Seal Sitters. It's a local volunteer organization dedicated to the protection of marine mammals along West Seattle's coastline. Now the art I've shown you has come from a variety of sources, uh, but the biggest change in the world of art in our public places was passage of the percent for art laws. Uh, Seattle, King County and Washington all have laws that say, if you're going to have a big capital program or any capital expenditure, build a building, remodel a park, a 1% uh, of the total in Seattle of your budget goes to public art. Same with King County, Washington has half of a percent. Well, that's a lot of money. So there have been a number of many artworks all throughout the city that have arisen from these uh, statues. Uh, statutes. <laughs> this uh, in, in the new city hall for Seattle, here's a good example. This was created in 2003. It's called Evolving Wing and Gravity of Presence by Eric Robertson, a native up in British Columbia. The reference uh, in, in the lower part is to native canoes, uh, boat hulls, and airplane wings are referred to in the silver area up above. And then the copper kind of conical shapes are referenced to native hats that would have been woven cedar and space shuttles that Boeing had a role in. Another example is the downtown library, which was also completed in 2003. This is called Making Visible the Invisible by George Legrady. Uh, he creates art experiences using digital technologies. In this case, there are six liquid crystal displays that visualize a statistical analysis of what patrons are checking out of the library. So if you check out a book, the, the Dewey Decimal number and everything about your book is going to appear on the screen. I should tell you, don't go look at it until 10 o'clock because I tried that and it wasn't on. And I asked the librarian and she said, well, it doesn't come on till 10 because it needs an hour to formulate and do its analysis. So then it pops on and you start seeing what books are being checked out. Another interesting piece at the new library is called LEW Wood Floor. This is Ann Hamilton's tribute to the production and reading of hard copy books. 
And she took the first lines of books within the library and then had them carved into this, uh, into the floor in a low relief uh, and, and it's all backwards as if it's typeset. So she's referring to the, you know, the old printing of books and, and uh, it's, it's, it's a pretty unusual piece. I recommend it to you. King County has been very active uh, in, in through their through four culture is the outfit that uh, the part of King County that runs the percent for art program. This is called Tumbling Figure Five Stages by local artist Michael Spafford. It's 70 feet high. It was commissioned for the kingdom and was there from 79 to 2000 and happily they took it out before they imploded the kingdom. And now it's at 6th and Jefferson on a parking garage on the west side. So you can see it much better than you ever could at the kingdom because the kingdom later put a ramp that kind of obscured looking at this. The, the, so now you can see the whole thing really out in the open. It was one of four major works commissioned for the kingdom. It consists of 17 black painted aluminum sections. It's an interpretation of Icarus falling from the sky. Uh, and Spafford uses Greco-Roman mythology as a visual framework to express such things as the struggle for achievement and the ultimate failure of a heroic effort. Now the federal government also uh, commissions artworks for its facilities. It doesn't have a 1% law, but it does uh, through the General Services Administration commission works. And its newest piece is this at the new federal courthouse downtown. This is called Pillar Arc by Ming Fei. Ming Fei is Shanghai born, but he's a New York based sculptor. And he's known for converting small items from nature to monumental sculpture. So similar to, to Henry Moore, who took bones and said, well, let's make them monumental. Here, this shape is kind of an odd shape, but this is an abstract monument uh, that's based on the scale of a cedar tree cone. And this is a tribute to the significance of the cedar tree to the region from native uses to the timber harvest. Now, as you, as you think about 1% for art and, and the large budgets that government entities may have, City Light has the biggest capital budget and it's a major commissioner of public art. And the two newest examples are at the Denny substation, which is at Denny Way and Stewart. This is called a switch wall. And switch wall is by a guy named Ned Kahn from California. He creates innovative sculptures that allow visitors to interact with and observe natural processes. They're often wind or water generated. In this case, those colored lights you see at the top, when he was downtown before he designed this, he looked out and saw building lights going on and thought, you know, a human flicks a little switch and all of a sudden you get lights coming on. So in this sculpture, all of those little uh, rectangular pieces you see are connected to a, uh, an electrode that when the wind blows, it blows the little piece back and forth. And whether it goes right or left, it'll be an uh, orange light or a blue light. So it's a unique uh, uh, approach to art. Uh, another example of what he does is this uh, piece at Fifth and Lenora. It's a, a Paul Allen development. This is called Tholian Web. And as you see it, you, it looks just like it might be some screen that's around a parking garage. Over on the right-hand side, you can see that that screen is made of these tiny little uh, square pieces and they're very delicately balanced. And when the wind blows, uh, you can see the undulations on all those little things as they go along the wall. It's kind of spooky before you get used to it, but that's the kind of thing that uh, Ned Kahn does. Tholian Webb, by the way, for you people who know Star Trek, it's a Star Trek episode where the Tholians uh, caused all sorts of trouble for the Enterprise, and uh, Ned Kahn knew that Paul Allen was a big Star Trek fan, so that's how it got its name. The other interesting piece at the substation is called Transforest. This is 110 feet tall. It's by Lead Pencil Studio, which consists of Annie Hahn and Daniel Mahalio in Seattle. And all their works arise from research that relate to where this piece is, is located. In this case, they're referring to power lines and the towers that bring us electricity across the mountains. It's also a tribute to the human effort and also a tribute to the trees that were removed and especially to snag trees. Those are the remnants of 
towering dead trees or dying trees that you might see. You can notice up at the top, the branches sticking out. Uh, the, those branches were inspired by their, their favorite snag tree in the Cascades. Now, two important events since the first book uh, are relatively recent. First was the arrival of Paul Allen, and I've mentioned him several times. This is a piece is called Typewriter Eraser Scale 10. This is by Klaus Oldenburg and Kosi van Brugge, done in 1999. It was in the Olympic Sculpture Park, and then he had it moved to Mopop, the, in the museum that he created. This is the mundane made monumental. Paul Allen thought it was a brilliant conceptual piece. Uh, nowadays, most people probably don't even know what it is, but it was, it is a typewriter eraser, and it's uh, appropriate that Paul Allen would have bought it because they were made obsolete by the creation of the computer and the laptop and the PC. Nobody uses typewriters anymore. Allen uh, started in Seattle with uh, works at CenturyLink Field. He had a company called First and Goal, which put up um, one and three quarter million dollars to commission 12 unique thought provoking artworks, uh, five of which are outside. This is on the big tower at the entrance. Most people don't pay much attention to it, but it's called Earth Dialogue by Robert Houses, who's a Warm Springs Chiricahua Apache, and it refers to our deep connections to the earth. At the bottom, uh, we see skyscrapers, that's the urban world, which supplants nature. The green disc is life and growth, and, but the upper half are human figures that are drifting away from, the, from nature. Yellow is the sun, which reminds us of the dependence of the natural world and the redemptive powers of nature. And white is the immensity of the natural environment. Another piece that's outside uh, at the stadium is Colossal Heads by Claudia Fitch of Seattle. This is at the stadium arcade entrance on the west side. These big heads were inspired by monumental statuary of Italy, corporate logos, street signage, and Rio de Janeiro's Carnival. Allen's most significant impact to art in public spaces in Seattle is the South Lake Union neighborhood. I mentioned how many pieces there are in chapter nine of the book. There are definitely too many to cover here, but it's a nice compact collection. I give a walking tour of South Lake Union and it works out very well. One that people always enjoy looking at is There is Another Sky which is on Westlake between Mercer and Republican in between two buildings. And this is kind of a skylight, but in it are uh, these discs of different uh, greens and yellows and oranges, and they represent uh, leaves in a forest. Uh, Spencer Finch is known for using color and light to create unique experiences. And this is because as you go through there, if you're paying attention, an awful lot of people don't, they don't even look up, but uh, it creates a green hue in this area uh, and it, uh, as the light filters through. So it's a pretty interesting effect. Another example of art in South Lake Union is another example of Lead Pencil Studio, Annie Hahn and Danny Mahalio. And this is another example of their combination of art and historical research. Uh, it, uh, it was done in 2015, it's called Restack. This is on the corner of 9th and Thomas. They call it non-functional architecture. And it's, uh, it reflects the incredible changes in South Lake Union. You can see arches there, there that refers to the older buildings. You'll note that the piece is not set back. The older buildings in the neighborhood weren't back in the 1880s, early 1900s. And the stacking of those shapes refers to the stacked pallets of the warehouses that were predominant in South Lake Union before it was developed. And also to the Amazon distribution centers with stacked boxes. And then finally, one of their uh, thoughts was the shadows that this piece makes. It refers to the ghosts of, of buildings past. Now, the second major event uh, since my 1992 book is the creation of Sam's uh, Seattle Art Museum's Olympic Sculpture Park. This is on a nine acre site. It's a former fuel storage and transfer facility, which was an environmental mess. And they got it all fixed up and they put a 2200 foot long Z shaped path, which crosses over railroad tracks. And over the railroad tracks is a unique bridge called Seattle Cloud Cover by Teresita Fernandez. It's laminated glass with enhanced photos of Seattle clouds and sky. And then when you walk over it, you note that there are holes in it. And that's through there, you can see views of the city. 
and she wanted you to feel like you're moving through a landscape painting as you as you walk over that bridge. Another major sculpture at the park is this piece, Schubert Sonata by Mark uh, de Suvero. It's a massive steel sculpture. It actually moves slowly in the wind. It has to be pretty strong wind, but it does move. And it's likened to a floating musical score. And de Suvero creates designs with rapid brush strokes in black paint on paper and he wants to see where it goes and it's kind of uh, kind of calligraphy in a way. And he describes his sculptures as painting in three dimensions. And a friend of his uh, said that his sculptures are really steel calligraphy. Two final works that I wanna show you are by Catalonian artist Jaume Plensa. Uh, this is Echo, kind of an iconic piece of the art museum. This and Calder's Eagle are the pieces I think people think about the most. Echo here is 45 feet tall. It's made of polyester resin and marble dust on a steel frame. Plensa created her in 2011. The title refers to the Greek myth about Echo, a talkative mountain nymph who angered the goddess Hera. And Hera was so irritated, she condemned uh, uh, Echo to never speak except to repeat the words she had just heard. Now, I had, a, I had an art museum docent attend one of my talks, and she said, you know, when we give our tours, we tell a lot about Echo. Well, I don't think really the story of Echo, other than what I've told you, is particularly relevant to the piece. In this piece, Plensa refers to the excess talking in today's world. He says, with so many messages around, we're not sure if our words are from ourselves or just the echo of something else. And he explains that Echo's eyes are closed to create a certain quietness, a place where you can listen again to your own words and your own heart. This last piece is called Miral. This is part of the Allen Collection in South Lake Union. It's at the Allen Institute for Brain Science, uh, Mercer and Westlake. It was created in 2012. And again, uh, the artist is thinking about communication. Uh, Miral is Catalan for mirror. These are mirror images of the other. There are two identical 12 foot high figures of white painted steel latticework and they face each other. Uh, they have no faces and the torsos, torsos are open and hollow and you can actually go inside them and, and kind of uh, meditate. Uh, I warn you when you go in, get your head down because there's a piece of metal that sticks down about their uh, sternum and you get hit in the head if you aren't careful. Uh, but Plensa views the human figure as a container for thoughts and emotions. And these hollow figures allow viewers to enter within and think quiet thoughts. A little difficult on Mercer. Uh, if you maybe go Sunday morning, that'd be a good time to have a quiet thought. Uh, but anyway, they're very impressive and they're lit at night. So I recommend it, seeing it at uh, any time of the day. These are constructed of letters from eight alphabets, all involved in communication. Hebrew, Arabic, Chinese, Japanese, Greek, Cyrillic, Hindi, and Latin, but there are no words spelled out. Plensa likens each of these letters to single cells in biology, which standing alone may accomplish very little, but when associated with others, they can create text and do a myriad of things. Now there's a lot going on in this sculpture and who knew? Well, those who have my book know, which brings me to my conclusion. In Norton Juster's fantasy, The Phantom Tollbooth, we learned that city dwellers understood that the most important reason for going from one place to another is to see what's in between. Then one day someone discovered that if you walk as fast as possible and look at nothing but your shoes, you would arrive at your destination much more quickly. And soon the citizens all followed that quicker approach and the city ultimately disappeared because no one cared to look at it. My message, if you don't look, it won't get as bad as all that, but our lives are richer when we know about the art around us. And with that, if there are any questions, I'll take them. There are several, uh, Jim, um, but I'm having trouble picking them up. Michael, can you help uh, get involved? Uh, one that I had, Jim, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. I wanted to ask about the um, Paul Allen's uh, uh, typewriter eraser. What mm -hmm. is the metal part of the sculpture behind it? Is that part of it or is that something else? Oh, that's the Mopop Museum. 
Oh, it's the museum itself. Yes. So the eraser is standing there alone, sort of. I see it over your shoulder, too. You've got it in your uh -huh. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Matter, matter of fact, I, I think it's such a cool photograph. Miguel Edwards was the photographer for the book, and somebody said, oh, wow. And they thought it was still at the Seattle Art Museum Olympic wow. Sculpture Park, and they thought this was uh, photoshopped. But uh, this is where it's placed on a circular piece with uh, landscaping on it. And uh, it's just a, a perfect location for it, I think. And, and you, you can see that the photo is a little dated because if you look up on the very top, uh, you can see the space needle, but there's a whole bunch of plywood on the base. And they were remodeling the space needle at the time. But most <laughs> people don't notice that. I would, and I haven't seen that uh, in person, so I'm going to have to. Um, Sharon thanks you for an enjoyable and informative presentation. Doug says, thank you, Jim. May we expect 1% of the billions of uh, dollars directed toward Washington via the infrastructure bill will go toward art? The infrastructure uh, bill. No, no, because that that's a federal grant. So it wouldn't, uh -huh. yeah. No, it's, it would be, it would be city generated money that would be the 1%. Okay. Sandy says, thanks, Jim. Lots of fun. Let's have lunch soon. <laughs> okay. That's Sandy uh, McVeigh. Rubeck. Go ahead. Yes. Yes. Um, I hope she's still there, but she can't respond to you, I guess. Don uh, Brubeck says, this is a wonderful quote about traveling in cities that you made earlier about oh. walking. You know, oh, okay. Walking. Yeah. Yes, it's true. Yes. Yeah, you know, I uh, I have a website that's going to be put out fairly re fairly soon, and I have a connection to a um, oh, can you still see the screen? Yes. Okay. Oh, um, no. Anyway, the uh, in uh, King News, uh, the evening program, uh, I spent about uh, two hours with them wandering around, and that piece by um, Spencer Finch, the um, the the tree leaves up on the up on the upper area uh, we were standing there and talking about it and all these people were walking by and we commented that nobody looked up they were all on their phones and uh, they just walked right through so it was a pretty good example of there's an awful lot of things to see with if you just take the time yeah. especially with our phones that's right yeah. linda cox thanks us and says how interesting and a question to you is, do you have a favorite piece of art here in Seattle? That's pretty tough, but I think uh, really one that I, I'm always impressed with is called Wawona in the lobby of Mohai uh, by John Grade. Um, and, and it's in my book. Uh, Mohai is not really a public place because you have to pay to get in. Uh, it's, you know, the, the, I, the, the works I pick, they have to be readily accessible. So if you have to pay to get in, I don't include it. But in that case, you can walk in the lobby and look at it. And it's 60 feet high. It's made of wood from the old sailing ship, Wawona. Uh, it swings a little bit. It's 11 tons, I think, and it's uh, swinging, hanging from the ceiling. And it's just a fascinating piece. And uh, John Grade is becoming world known for these unique sculptures he created. He's the one who did the, the huge uh, tree sculpture that hangs in the lobby of the Seattle Art Museum. And then he has a brand new piece of another tree inspired sculpture in the new uh, North Satellite at SeaTac. And his last name is? Grade, G-R-A-D-E, like grade. Oh, okay, thank you. And what do you find the most surprising about the public art here in Seattle? Uh, that there's so much of it and there's so much of it and it's a varied collection there really isn't any city of you know that has more works per capita and when my first book came out in 1992 it sold in new york and san francisco and chicago and the oxford university uh, review even talked about it a little bit and the reason was is because seattle was a real leader in art and public spaces in the one percent for art and while on the East Coast, ours was not the first 1% for art program. Uh, I think, I forget, Philadelphia, I think, 
was the first and there were a couple of others. But back there, the Arts Commission was composed of art collectors and those who knew art. Well, that's okay, but here uh, the Arts Commission always had a lot of artists and they stirred things up. And Richard Andrews, who used to be head of the program for the, for the city and then became head of the Henry Gallery, he said that it was really a yeasty environment because you, know, you might have a collector that says, well, you know, I, I think we should do that, that piece there. And the artist just says, no, 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 that, that doesn't take much imagination at all. We need to do something a little different. And so we came up with a lot of really inventive and innovative uh, artworks around town. And that's still going on, not as well as it used to, but uh, it just art is ever present in Seattle. Excellent. And I didn't know about the other cities in comparison. Another question here. What in particular drew you to this comprehensive study of art? Um, you know, I've just always been interested in it. Uh, as I said, when I was in high school, I liked art uh, and uh, I used to wander around and observe it and enjoy seeing it. And I just always thought that uh, there ought to be a book about it. But I don't know. It's one of those things, you know, my, my parents, uh, they weren't uh, art collectors. I mean, uh, I wasn't exposed to that. Later when I was in, well, I guess probably when I started in junior high, that early it didn't have that much of an effect. But my, my aunt and uncle were Marshall and Helen Hatch, who were major art collectors in the Pacific Northwest. And I think they had about a little over 40 Morris Gray's paintings, among other things. And uh, I was telling Michael earlier, the way this book came about is, or the first book, is they were uh, they created a committee with Ann Gould Hauberg and a number of other people and the head of the UW Press and the head of the university bookstore to try and raise money for the publication of a book by about Philip McCracken. McCracken's the one who did the restless bird, the big ass bird. Uh, and they usually needed the bartender. So they asked me to come and bartend at the meeting at their house. And then it was time for dinner. And they said, let's have dinner. And then they said, now it's time for a meeting. We need a secretary. So obviously I was set up and I became the secretary. Uh, but uh, in one of these meetings, I said, you know, I've always wanted to do a book on art and public places in Seattle. And the UW Press said, boy, we'd publish it. And the university bookstore said, uh, uh, you know, we, we think it'll sell. So I did it. Uh, there were some people who didn't think it would work. I have in my file a handwritten letter from um, Virginia Wright, uh, who was one of the leading art collectors and art supporters in the area. And she said, you know, when you told me about this book, I didn't think it would work at all. And it just, it, it's, now it's all encompassing and it covers everything well and you did a great job. So that's how that book came, came about. That's wonderful. A lot of your audience are saying things like that too. Alan Murray says, great talk, Jim. Good, thank um, you. Clark Cooper says, thank you for the wonderful book. We have used it to explore the city and all the art. It's fun to search for the exact location of the art. We love the big ass bird. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Sue and David, did you know they were here? They sent a note earlier to let you know they were here. And they are asking, well, a comment saying, thank you for the presentation too, wonderful. What oh, trends have you seen over time in this art from them? That question from them. What trends? Yes. Well, uh, in the, the biggest trend, I think, in the uh, outside of the downtown area, probably true, uh, two, one is we're doing, I don't know if we're doing pretty well, but we're doing much more with contemporary native uh, and, and local uh, Salish inspired works. Uh, a lot of young artists are, are doing contemporary works based on uh, traditional Salish forms. And in fact, I'm doing another talk on, uh, on the history in the, of, of native art in Seattle. But uh, that's one thing. And the other thing is, especially in the neighborhoods, and this will be uh, discussed in the upcoming book about neighborhood uh, public art, is a lot of pieces emphasize the culture of the community. One example is at a 
library in the South End, there's a lot of, of residents from Southeast Asia and in various other places in Asia. And so the artwork that was commissioned incorporates a lot of stories and, and uh, forms from different cultures. Cultures. So there might be a story from Cambodia and then another myth from Vietnam, all, all in, included in the artwork. So those are, uh, those, are, those are two trends that are probably that come to mind. Mm, interesting. Marcy Johnson says this is a terrific presentation. Thank you, Jim. My pleasure. Um, Doug, oh, wants to know how does one go about strategically superheading public investment of art in neighborhoods versus relying on art sensitive developers to randomly invest in art on their properties that the public may or may not have access to? Well, I'm, I'm, not, quite, I'm not quite sure about the first part. The, the, the developers uh, more and more, even people who were building condos and uh, you know apartment buildings are creating artworks that are readily accessible. Uh, sometimes they're in the lock lobby, but other times they're out in the front. Uh, sometimes they're not all that good, uh, <laughs> but, but they're artworks. And that's one thing about the book is if they're there, I tell about them. But that's, that's becoming more common. Um, but I'm not, I don't remember, repeat the first part of the question. How does one go about strategically spearheading public investment? of art in neighborhoods versus relying on art sensitive oh, developers? Well, public investment, I mean, that's the public investment is pretty much through the 1% for art. So uh, one can work with for culture and lobby for certain things to be included, I, I think. But uh, I don't really know, I haven't given it much thought. Okay, well, we'll stay tuned. Yeah. Sharon Levine asks, what are some of the other public fountains that are covered in your books? Well, gosh, uh, downtown, there's the Naramore Fountain uh, by George Sudakawa. Uh, there is the Waterfront Fountain by James Fitzgerald. That's the one that fell into Elliott Bay, and I don't know what's going on with that. I, they've talked about getting it out, and then what they do with it, I don't know. Um, let's see, what are the fountains? Well, not in the current book, but in the next book, we'll include uh, the large Sudakawa fountain at uh, what used to be the Safeco building in the U District. It's now the UW property, but uh, that's a major work by George. Um, what other fountains? At the moment, I can't think of other fountains. It's interesting, there used to be another James Fitzgerald fountain down at the IBM building, and the sculpture is still there, but the, the fountain uh, leaked into the garage, and they finally gave up trying to repair that. So the, the uh, piece is, is kind of similar to the, it's, it's the craggy, eroded steel or, or bronze that you saw at the uh, Cornish Playhouse, but it's, ver it's horizontal. But it's now just a sculpture, and it looks pretty good. But it's a sculpture surrounded by flowers, and it's just uh, north of the IBM building in the plaza there. How about Harbor Steps? Don Brubeck, Free Freeway Park. Oh well, Freeway Park, sure. I forgot about Freeway. I don't. I don't Harbor Steps. I wouldn't consider it. Just I, I don't consider that an artwork. But and you know to each his own. That's just flowing water. Uh, the book does include uh, the freeway park because that is a, uh, you know, unique piece that uh, is part sculptural. Some of those walls that you look at, and I think there's a pretty good photograph illustrating this point, uh, were kind of influenced by uh, Aztec. I think it's Aztec, but uh, uh, native Mexican uh, forms. Ah. How, um, waterfall Garden is fantastic, Doug says. Waterfall Garden. Waterfall Garden. Where's that? I'm trying to think. Pre oh, of course, of course. You're talking about you're talking about the Annie Casey Park, uh, I think, where uh, UPS was founded in 1907. Oh, that's excellent. Yes, and that's included in the book too. That was designed and and created by Japanese uh, landscape artists. And. Yeah. Uh, that's the 
the, probably the most expensive park per square foot in the city, and they did a bang up job. All right. Um, Sharon Levine is asking, and this might be your opportunity to give the plug for your book. When will your neighborhood's book be available? You know, it's hard to say. I when the when the first book came out in December of 2019, I was saying two years. Uh, the pandemic slowed everything down, and frankly, one of our big challenges is the the manuscript is pretty much done because. My original idea was to have a book about art in Seattle's public spaces throughout the city. Well, that would be about 750 pieces of art. And the manuscript was 111,000 words and the UW Press said, we better do a smaller one to begin with. Um, so the manuscript is pretty much done. Photographing artworks is kind of a challenge these days because there are an awful lot of them that are surrounded by homeless camps or have been adversely affected by a lot of uh, graffiti or things pasted on them. So uh, that's going to be a challenge. Uh, we'll see what we can do. I was. No, I don't know when it's going to come out. A couple of years, I think. Oh, all right. Well, let us know. We can advertise it. All right. You, perhaps. Yes. I wanted to ask about the challenge you must have had in finding a photographer or do you use many photographers? Uh, I've always used one photographer and it's always been, except for the one for neighborhoods where a guy named Rich Birmingham is a very good photographer and I've known him for years. Uh, but for the first book, I thought, I don't know where I'm going to get all the photographs. Maybe I can collect them from the city. I don't know. But Mary Randlett found out about the book and she was a very well-known photographer and took photographs of all of the major artists of the 50s, 60s and 70s. Um, and she called and said, I want to do the photographs for the book. And I thought, boy, this is a blessing. And that worked out really well. And then with Miguel Edwards for the second book, I called him because he's also a sculptor. And he has a major work in Greenwood. Uh, and this is an example of an apartment building owner who wanted a sculpture. And so Miguel did this sculpture that's about two stories high called... Um, Oh, I can't remember. But anyway, so I called him and I was asking him about the sculpture. And then I told him what I was doing. And I said, I'm, you know, the next project, the next thing I have to do is find a photographer. And he said, well, I'm a professional photographer. So there we went. Worked out very well. That's a great story. Per Perseus, that's the name of his sculpture. Oh, and it's in the na Greenwood neighborhood? Yeah. Okay. Marcy Johnson said that she missed, she's... Sadly missed the first 15 minutes. Did you include Hammering Man at Sam? No, and the only reason I didn't is because I'm limited on, you know, if I had a two hour talk, I probably would. But yeah. Hammering Man is certainly in the book. And, and right. by the way, by the way, this is being recorded so you can hear the first part of the talk if you want to. <laughs> Excellent. I think that wraps this up. I. I hope I have re I picked up everybody's question, but lots of compliments for you, Jim. And it really was very informative. You just um, feel spontaneous with um, not only answering the specific question, but some more details that you have. And it makes us all want to go out and see these for ourselves and enjoy what the sculptor and the photographer and now the author has intended for us to do. Well, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. I enjoyed it. As you can tell, I like talking about the subject. Well, that's good. Do you, um, yeah, lots more thank yous coming in for, for us and for you. And um, please let us know when that book is finished and we'll, we'd like to hear more about it and help publicize it for you. All right. Thank you very much. Nice to have met you, Jim. Thank you. Thank you, All everybody, right. for being here. Tune in second Thursday of every month. See you in December. Yeah, I just want Bye. to echo Dora Faye's thank you message as well. Thank you, Jim. For, that was a wonderful, wonderful presentation. And, and I have a lot of art to go look at in the city uh, now. I, I've yes. got to explore and I, I hope our audience feels the same way. And, and uh, yeah, I'm grateful for everybody who's joined us tonight. And, and um uh, of course, we, we'd encourage you to pick up a copy of Jim's book uh, at... Uh, our, our local bookstores here in West Seattle, uh, uh, 
uh, Paper Boat Booksellers and Pegasus Book Exchange. Jim, I don't know if you have a favorite bookstore that, that you'd like to, to uh, uh, recommend as well, but uh, of course, well, please, those who aren't, free to do so. Well, those who aren't in, uh, in West Seattle, I always go to Third Place Books. That's one of my favorites. They have one in uh, the Seward Park and one in Ravenna and one in Lake Forest Park. And Burien, I think. Ah, okay. Good Thank to know. Well, I, again, I hope everybody enjoyed this evening's program. Thank you again for joining us. We're looking forward to seeing you next month. And until then, um, uh, be well. And, and, and again, uh, have a great Thanksgiving and, and we'll see you soon. All right, everybody. Thanks again. You. Good night. Thank you, Michael. Good night, Jim. Take care.